May God bless and keep you always. May your wishes all come true. May you always do for others and let others do for you. May you build a ladder to the stars. Climb on every rung And may you stay Guild, Local 600, and I'm also humbled and honored to be the president of the Southeastern Central uh, North Carolina Labor Council, which is an amalgamation of 17 different unions in five southeastern counties that include New Hanover, Brunswick, Pender, Columbus, and Duplin counties. Approximately a year ago, I was attending the North Carolina AFL-CIO convention in Raleigh as a delegate for my union while presenting my credentials at check-in, I was given a book, Compliments of the Communication Workers of America. I took that book home and read it. Uh, well, to coin a phrase, it set my hair on fire, <laughs> as you can tell. <laughs> I immediately took the book to my good friend George Glossitz at the um, Wilmington Progressive Book Club, and George and I uh, then went searching for another sponsor, which we found in Dr. Daniel Buffington um, at the University of North Carolina. Um, uh, soon after that, uh, Dr. Daniel Buffington brought in the uh, sociology department, the psychology department, the um, criminology department, and the uh, communication studies department. And the three of us with our respective groups were able to uh, get them to pony up the money so that we could get Mr. Leopold here this evening. So. Uh, I, I want to thank George and Daniel and my beloved uh, Central Labor Council, the Progressive Book Club, and the respective departments of the university for ponying up that money to make this event happen. I also th have to say thanks to uh, the ILA Local 1426 and President Greg Washington and his staff to include Fred and Erica Key for their continuing support in the Central Labor Council and the use of the hall this evening. Uh, I also thank, want to thank the United Steelworkers Local 1025 and their president, uh, Wilhelmina Hardy, uh, and Jason Rosine and Kelly Bordeaux at IATSE uh, Local 491. Uh, I have to thank my CLC uh, Vice President, who's somewhere out here, uh, Mike Hill from the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, Local 495, and Sandra Stewart from American Federation of Government Workers, Local uh, 3059. Uh, I want to give a big shout out to Caesar Levea. Um, from the Communication Workers of America, and Aiden Graham, who is with us here tonight from the North Carolina AFL-CIO. 
Uh, we also have to say thanks to our co-sponsors that include the New Hanover County Democratic Party, chaired by Richard Poole, and we have uh, 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 also Suzanne Warner, who's uh, one of the first chairs on that. Um, the Brunswick County Democratic Party, under the leadership of Janice Simmons and Dr. Tom Simmons. The Pender County Democratic Party, chaired by Debbie Fintak, and the New Hanover County Young Democrats, led by Clayton Hamersky. Additional co-sponsors include the North Carolina Alliance of Retired Americans and their field rep, Heather McLaughlin, who drove across the state to be with us this afternoon but had to leave and go back to uh, Raleigh for a meeting in the morning. Uh, we also have to include thanks to Suit Up Wilmington, organizers uh, Megan Mullins and uh, Jessica uh, Cannon, Cape Fear Indivisible, Wilmington Progressive Coalition with leader Rebecca Stutz and Wilmington support for the port. Finally, I want to say, say thank you to Les Leopold himself, who's been so gracious and so accommodating from the first time I ever called him. We are so very grateful for his helping to make this evening possible. Uh, I now want to turn things over to my very good friend, George Vlasitz, who will introduce our speaker. I'm going to introduce our speaker by talking a little bit about his book, uh, because that is the uh, thing that we want everybody to be able to see, to read, and to use uh, in discussing the issue of runaway inequality. Um, as Herb mentioned, uh, he introduced me to the book, um, and at first I was like, well, yeah, I've read, you know, I've read uh, Thomas Piketty, I've read Reich, I've read Stiglitz. Uh, do I need another book on inequality? Um, he insisted, and I read it. And uh, to use another analogy rather than the hair one, since I still have most of mine, um, <laughs> it knocked my socks off. Um, so, uh, just a little bit about the book, and then uh, I'll let Les uh, tell you mo a lot more about what's in it. Uh, the, the book is written in a way in, that explains not only that we have runaway inequality, but why we have it. What is the basic reason, and the concept that Les introduced uh, to me was the concept of financial strip mining. And I'm sure he's going to explain a lot more about what that means. Anyhow, the book was written. It's got uh, some wonderful graphs. But it was an explanation, uh, not only that about what the economy had done, but how the runaway inequality linked to all the social and political issues about which I was very concerned, and I'm sure you are too. Um, so that's why when, when um, Herb said, well, Les will come down uh, to talk about the book, I said, great. And so for the past two and a half months, we've been working uh, to get the word out, and now you will have a chance to hear uh, Les explain what runaway inequality is all about. I give you Les Leopold. Thank you for the very gracious uh, introductions and the, all the hosting that you've been doing. Uh, I'm deeply indebted to Herb and George for, and Daniel for uh, getting me here. Uh, only one little thing I need to say is that when Herb said, you know, they had to raise money from these 15 different people, I just want you to know that none of it goes to me personally. <laughs> it, all, very yeah, it all goes back into this campaign that I'm going to try to recruit you into before the night is over. So uh, let's start with uh, an easy question. Why is Trump president? Why did he win? Any ideas? Bold and racist Americans. Anything else? Yes. Tricky guy. Tricky guy. Anything else? He used fear and hate. Used fear and hate. Anything else? Because he stole the election. 
stole the election. All right, there you go, capitalist. We'll get to that, yeah. Represents the interest of corporate America and money and lower taxes. Interest of corporate America, money, and lower taxes, he represented. Anything else come to mind? He confirmed a narrative. He confirmed the narrative. What narrative was that? The narrative that America can be fixed if we just trust business enough. Ah, that America can be fixed if we just trust business enough. America loves a con man. America loves a con man. What else? He's a white male. Uh, okay. That's a good place to, what, yes? Tells you what, tells people what they want to hear. Tells people what they want to hear. Now, how unusual is that for a politician? Yeah. No, no offense, Dr. K. Uh, pardon? People like orange hair, okay. Uh, I'm thinking about that for the next, for my next book. Uh, anything else? Associate with the Klan. So, associate with the? Associate with the Klan. Associate with the, with the Klan? Yeah, with the Klan. I saw that, yes. Uh, he promised that he was draining the swamp. Draining the swamp. He promised he drained the swamp. All right. I've been asking this question all over the country. Uh, I had a chance to, uh, uh, the responses are very much similar to yours. When I did it closer to the election, Comey came up more often. You know, the Russians came up. Uh, uh, but pretty much it's the same set, set of uh, uh, causes. I'm going to add a couple of more to the picture for your consideration that takes us into our talk tonight. Uh, in my opinion, the problem runs deeper than Trump, and it's older than Trump. Since 2008, the Democrats have lost 917 state, local, and national elections where their candidate was in power. The Democrats have lost 917. So it's not just that Trump got in, it's all the whole, so, so the whole party is kind of in collapse. The vote loss from Obama to Clinton, 500,000 lost in Michigan, 290,000 in, in uh, Pennsylvania, 222,000 in Wisconsin. That's a big shift. So think about it for a second. People who voted for a black presidential candidate ended up not voting uh, for the Democrat. So, so that tells you something big was going on. Now here's another scary thing. Republicans control 33 of the 50 governorships. And in a, uh, in a majority of them, they have both houses as well. They get to 36 they can start to call for a constitutional convention and change the Constitution. And do all, you can imagine the kinds of things they'd want to put in the Constitution. All right, so what's behind that? I'm going to hear the two additional reasons. One of them, somebody stole my thumb, thunder already. I'd say one of the reasons is a reaction to runaway inequality. I think both the Sanders campaign and the Trump campaign uh, were, were benefiting, were actually fueled by people's uh, anger, disappointment, frustration about what they see as runaway inequality. They're not getting ahead, and this very small group of uh, elite corporate and fi financiers are sort of running away with the country. Uh, and the second thing is I would argue that the progressive community is poorly organized, uh, and that we're fractured. We're in a zillion different groups. Each, one, each group pushing its own issue as if, it were, as if it were a standalone issue. And one of the things we try to do in the book and in our talks is to show how the issues are fundamentally related by runaway inequality. And maybe we should start coming out of our issue silos and join together around a common agenda and a common movement. Uh, maybe. So, uh, so, so I'm going to first work on runaway inequality and introduce you to that in more detail. And then at the end, hopefully we'll have some time to get into this as well. Ready for the ride? Sure. Yeah. All right? All right. You didn't, I hope you didn't eat as much as I did today. I mean, they're feeding me to death in this town. <laughs> I'm ready for a nap. OK, let's go. So the first question is, how big is the pay gap between the top 100 CEOs and the average worker in the United States now? Any ideas for people who didn't read the book? 
400? 500? 500? 500. Well, okay. all right. When you ask the American people in a survey what they think the gap is, they say about 45 to 1. Okay? If you ask them what they think it ought to be, a strong Democrat will say 5 to 1. A strong Republican will say 12 to 1 for an average of 7 to 1. So they think it's 45 to 1. They'd like it to be about 7 to 1. And let, let's figure out what this actually means. What would 45 to 1 mean? If you have one home, it means a top CEO could have 45 homes. If you have one car, they could have 45 cars. So 45 to 1 is a pretty big gap. No? I, 45 homes, I think I could manage that. No problem. Or you could send you know, 45 kids to an expensive college uh, without going into debt. OK, so let's take a look at what it is. Well, the American people were right in 1970. Basically, the American people think it's 1970. It's 45 to 1. Watch what's happened since 1970. 1980, 1990, 2010. We're jumping to 2014. It was a 44 to 1. One home for you, 844 for them. I cannot wrap my mind around 844 homes compared to one. You know, we have two cars. That would be 1,688 cars. You're talking about an extreme, extreme gap. So people want it to be 7 to 1. If they knew it was 844 to 1, you might have a revolt in this country. They think it's here. So we are trying to introduce into the American dialogue the concept of runaway inequality. And I think we're going to have some success with that. All right, so let's move on. Let's compare ourselves to some other countries. Here's the United States. Now here's Switzerland, Germany, Spain, France. We're a little bit of an outlier. The next highest country is Switzerland, where all the banks are, et cetera, the secret Swiss accounts, 148. Canada, by the way, we just looked it up, is 185. Uh, so we're way out there. Now, this is the only chart that's going to be on your final exam tonight. So I want you to pay close attention to it. Because this is, helps us tell the story of what happens. This top line, this tr the chart from 1947, which you can't see in the back row, and you probably can't see it in the front row. 1947 all the way up till today. And this is productivity in the United States. Does anybody know how productivity is defined? It's kind of a technical term. It's output, the total goods and services produced in the economy, divided by the hours of labor. Not by how much labor is paid, just by how much is produced per hour. So it's a very good measure uh, of our uh, productive capacity. It tends to be the case that the countries that have rising productivity year after year after year, have the most uh, ability to uh, take care of their own people because product productivity allows you to produce a lot of goods and services. So it is the measure, the sum total of our technology, our educational system, our physical infrastructure, uh, uh, the, the skills of our workforce, all that comes together to produce uh, productivity. So as you can see from 1947 till today, Productivity has gone up virtually in every year. A couple of years it was flat, and then it shot up again. We, we, we produce almost three times as much per hour of labor as we did in 1947, and we have tens of millions of more workers. All right, so that's, that's the first little technical thing you're getting tonight. So what's the big deal? Here's the second line. Average weekly wages of the non-supervisory and production worker, that's 85% of all working people, so uh, what you can see is from 1947 until the mid-late 1970s, when productivity went up, so did the average real wage. Real meaning buying power after you take out the impact of inflation, which you could really buy. You could see that from 47 until the mid-1970s, uh, uh, when productivity went up, so did the average real wage. And those people who are my age might remember that your families were probably doing a little bit better every year. And if you're older than me, you might remember that you were doing even better in the 50s. And this was pretty much covered all working people saw their real wages go up. I saw it in my family. Uh, my parents, by the 1960s, could they're working class people. They could actually take it. They took a cruise 
down to the Caribbean for the first time they took a vacation that was more than three days as far as I could tell. Uh, my sister, who's eight years older than I am, went to a public college. By the time I was going to school, they could, they, I got a scholarship and a loan, but they could afford to subsidize me to go to a private school. Uh, so the standard of living was going up. And then I, I was in graduate school right here. I'll tell you a story. Uh, in our economics classes, they taught us this was an iron law, that it had to happen. They showed us these various supply and demand curves. And when productivity, if productivity went up too high, I, I, then uh, the manager, uh, the companies would bid up the price of labor to get it back on the line. If, it, if labor went above the line, then inflation would bring it back down. It all worked out perfectly. No sooner did I graduate, they repealed the law. <laughs> they just threw it out. Uh, uh, somebody asked me, was there a legislative session that repealed it? No, 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 it didn't happen quite that way. It was an economic law. And all of a sudden, the two lines pulled apart. I mean, really pulled apart. Why did that happen? If we understand why it happened, we have the key uh, to runaway inequality. Let me, let me just point out something here. You know how much the gap is between these two lines? A couple of trillion dollars of money that used to go to working people that's now going to someplace else. Imagine for a second your paychecks. Close your eyes and look at that lovely line, your paycheck. Double it. That's what would have happened if that iron law wasn't repealed, if wages continued to rise. Your wage would be double what it is today, or you'd be getting the same amount of money working half the hours. Half the hours for the same money. So what happened? Any ideas? Maybe capital got more expensive. <laughs> Reagan? Yeah, well, Reagan comes in a little later. But he certainly, he certainly helps. What else happens? What? Justice Powell. Justice Powell, please. Oh my god, we Justice Powell. Uh, CWA has unleashed the monster on, on the, pardon? Capital got more expensive. Capital got more expensive, OK. Women entered the workforce in record numbers. Women entered the workforce in record numbers. Anything else? Financialization of the economy. Pardon? The financialization of the economy. Thank you very much. You, so, so, Someone, uh, someone scooping my line here. <laughs> I was doing workshops on this. We started to see there was an issue, especially after Reagan was ele elected. And the suspects that we rolled out in our classes, we call them like the four horsemen of the workplace. Use and abuse of temporary workers, where a lot of the women went. Uh, automation, uh, 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 tax on labor, and uh, globalization, right? There was, Globalization, everybody talked about globalization. We figured we had it nailed. And it turned out we were wrong. It, uh, the press, by the way, still says it's automation. That somehow there's this, you know, automation came in and just, you know, uh, sort of overnight ripped the two lines apart. The computers came in or something came in. And some people, a lot of people say corporate greed. And it's like somebody turned on a switch in 1975 and all of a sudden, the corporations that day say, you know what, tomorrow we're going to be greedier than we were today. <laughs> so maybe, I mean, it's, it's it, Suppression of labor power. Yep, suppression of labor power. So I did, frankly, I wrote two books on finance uh, before this one. And I didn't have it right. I didn't really understand what happened until I came across a study by the International Labor Organization, which is, uh, was set up by the UN after World War II. And uh, it has a bunch of labor economists, and they, they work out of Switzerland, and they do these great studies, which are not that easy to understand. But if you read them four or five times, which I had to, it started to make sense. So here's what they came up with. They tested the usual suspects. And they found that technology, uh, they, they looked at the, why the wages went flat. That's what they were concerned with. And they looked at 70 developed nations to try to figure out why they went flat in slightly different ways in different countries. So they said 10% of the problem was technology, not 100% or 80% or what the media says these days. 10%. Globalization, big, bad globalization, 19%. Attacks on labor and cutbacks in social spending, 25%. And then the biggest cause, as my colleague here said, uh, something called financialization, something I never heard of. No idea. Two books on finance. I had no idea what, what they meant. So I read the report again and again. And finally, what the, I realized what they, uh, well, first what I did is I went and looked up the word. And it turned out it was coined by my fellow graduate student, lo and behold, I, when he became an economist. Uh, 
And, but he used the word finance in the definition of financialization, so it ran me in a circle. I didn't, still didn't get it. But the report finally uh, got it across to me. The countries that had the biggest financial sectors, the biggest Wall Street type operations, had the most inequality. It was that simple. So there's something about Wall Street that has something to do with rising inequality. What was it? So the next thing we did is our researchers, our big research team, me and one other guy, we went diving into this and we looked at the wages on, uh, the in the financial sector versus the wages everywhere else. Here are the financial incomes rising and then all of a sudden they go through the roof and here's, it, here's every place else in the economy that's not related to Wall Street. They stay flat. I go, whoa, look at this picture. It looks just like our productivity wage chart. We've got two charts that look the same. Usually this means that they're connected. We don't know if this is causing that or that is causing this or something else is causing both of them, but it gives us a clue that the money went somehow into the financial sector. They certainly benefited from it. How did that happen? So that becomes the next question. Still with me? Yeah. Yeah. Past, it's past my bedtime, so I'm not going to hold it against you if you're not. Okay, so how does so much wealth end up on the, on the top in Wall Street? And here's where the star, uh, story gets uh, really interesting. Back in the 19, uh, well, there's always been this group of people that believed all this stuff about uh, trying to use the economy to make life better for people was wrong. That what you should do is just let the private sector basically run everything. Get the government out of the economy. And this guy, Milton, Milton Friedman, a, a very uh, famous economist from the University of Chicago, even had a TV show about this in the 1970s. Well, the economy got rocky in the 1970s. You had uh, uh, you know, uh, overspending on the Vietnam War, you had oil shocks, you had inflation, you had unemployment, and politicians were, and the policy people were looking for uh, new answers. And uh, Friedman's idea, which today uh, uh, academics call neoliberalism, but we call it the better business climate model. This idea takes hold and captures both political parties and uh, most economic departments, including the one, uh, including the economist that, 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 that I was studying with. So here's how it works. You cut taxes. This is gonna all sound familiar to you because it's now our common sense. You cut taxes, especially on, on the wealthy. You cut regulations. And the biggest regulation of all in the economy are unions. So anything you can do to uh, reduce uh, unionization means you're reducing regulations, but they mean all kinds of regulations. Uh, you cut government social spending so that nobody gets anything for nothing, really. So people are more hungry to go out and work. And you privatize functions of government because it, the private sector can do those things better, cheaper, more efficient, and that leads to a profits and investment boom, and then all boats will rise. Now, every politician not named Dr. K and Bernie will, in, in both parties, <laughs> will say something like this. They will say we have to make a better business climate in the state of X. Uh, I live in New Jersey, but we get the ads for New York, and uh, Governor Cuomo is on there, you know, every night saying how, you know, come, basically come to New York, we'll give you tax breaks, we'll cut regulations, we'll make it easy for you to be here. So the better business climate got drilled in to the whole political system. Now here's the interesting point. They had no clue what this would mean when they deregulated Wall Street. They spent no time thinking about it in the most radical economics textbook in the country that you can get right now, there's one page on Wall Street. There were no courses in graduate school on Wall Street in the 70s. Milton Friedman could care less what deregulation meant uh, to Wall Street. But Wall Street cared. They knew that from the New, New Deal on during our most prosperous period, the government had its foot on the neck of Wall Street. We didn't let them do a thing without uh, uh, someone checking on it. So it was a, a sleepy little backwater. If we go back to this chart for a second here, that's why it didn't matter whether you worked on Wall Street or work, you know, if you worked for Chase Manhattan Bank or General Motors, given your level of skill, knowledge, et cetera, it didn't matter. You got paid about the same. Maybe banker's hours were a little shorter. And then all of a sudden there's this enormous premium for working on Wall Street. That, did, that wasn't an act of God, that was the deregulation of Wall Street. 
it unleashed a monster that nobody, nobody anticipated. So let me take you forward here. Here's what happened. My Uncle Fred here. Uh, the first after finance was deregulated around 1980, there's a group of people, then they had always been around, called corporate raiders, that saw their opening. They saw that they could buy up companies using borrowed money. And so what? It sounds like that's a big deal. Well, here's what they did. By the way, this was not really permitted before the late 70s uh, and 1980 because they, they were so tightly controlled. So first what they did is they took, as soon as they would buy a company, they took a special dividend back for themselves. So it'd be like, you know, you buy a house and the house gives you back your down payment. Wouldn't that be nice? You buy the house, the house gives you back a down payment, a special dividend. Mitt Romney and Bain Capital were famous for doing this. Close the deal, give yourself back a special dividend. All right, you give some to the CEOs and the bankers that help put the deal together, and then you make the whole company pay it back. The debt's not on your shoulder. How many people here have bought a car with a car loan? Who pays back the loan, you or the car? <laughs> no, seriously. If you bought Avis or Hertz, Avis or Hertz would pay back the loan, not you. That was the beauty of these uh, uh, corporate uh, takeovers. And of course, once people saw this, that this was going to work and no one was going to stop them, it happened again and again and again. And virtually every company that any of you have ever worked for has gone through this. All right, so. Now, now you got a problem. You just took over Hertz or Avis or General Mills or whatever, and you want to get as much wealth out of this. You're, you're the big investor. You want, to get, you want to suck the wealth out of the company. How do you do that? Well, what you got to do is you need a straw boss. You need somebody that's going to help you do that on the inside of the company. You don't have time to do that because you're going to buy a bunch of companies. You want somebody else in there, and that person is going to be the CEO and the top officers. So to put them on your wavelength, you've got to change the way they're paid. Back in 1980 or before, 95% of a CEO's pay was salary and bonuses, and about 5% were stock incentives. They changed that. They increased the amount of stock incentives from almost nothing in 1980 to this is now all the top 500, not 100, to at least nine, ten million dollars a year on average, some in the hundreds of millions. Then, uh, today, five percent of a, the average CEO's salary, uh, salary and bonuses, five percent of their pay is salary and bonuses. That's it, five percent. The rest, or just about all the rest, are stock incentives. All right, now think about this for a second. I know we got some CEO material in the room. Think about it. You're a CEO. Almost all your pay is stock incentives. You go to work the next day. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? You're going to make the value of the stock go up. Of course you are. You're not, you didn't take the job to be an altruist. You want the stock to go up. How? How do you make the stock go up? How do you do it? Stop. The people that read the book, keep your hand down. Outsourcing, that's one. What else? Efficiencies. What else? You want to make that stock go up. You need strategies to milk the company. And they came up with an incredible one that was illegal before they came up with it, or, or virtually illegal. Uh, we call it stock manipulation. They took the company's money, went into the stock market, and bought back the company's own shares. Now, what, what, is, what does that do? Let's pause for a second. Assume, what's your name? James. James and I own a million dollar company and 50-50 ownership. He's got one share and I've got one share. Each share is worth $500,000. James decides he's going to uh, buy me out. So I'm gone. My share's gone. Now James has, owns the company. His share is now worth a million dollars. He's reduced the number of owners. The remaining owner 
that share is going to be more valuable. This works even with millions of shares. Also, if you're going to buy millions of dollars worth of shares, you have to go into the market and bid up the price just a little bit. Well, lo and behold, if you manipulate the price, it goes up. The value of your stock incentives go up. You get richer as the CEO. And of course, the investor gets richer as well. And they can pull out. As soon as the stock goes up, they can start selling shares and make a quick gain. Well, you, you, you think this is just a little sideshow? This is the main event of corporate America. Here's the, the profits of all the companies in the, four, in the uh, uh, Standard & Poor's, the 500 biggest companies. As, this is what percent of their profits they use for stock buybacks. 2% in 1981. They allowed a little bit. Then they changed the rule. By 2007, by the time of the crash, 75% of all corporate profits went to stock buybacks. Every dollar that they can save at work, 75 cents, went to stock buybacks. And some companies went over 100%. How did they do that? Who said that? <laughs> Borrow money. They would load more debt onto the company, use that money to buy back, uh, buy back more than 100% of their profits. Why? Because that's what they do when they go to work. They look at the, the value of, the, of their uh, stock, and they want to make it go up. That's how they get paid all across the board. This is modern corporate America. Now watch what this does. You need money to do this. So you downsize through layoffs, you ship production abroad, you sell off product lines and divisions, you speed up production, you raid the pension funds or you discontinue them, you cut wages and benefits, you change the whole corporate culture from retain and reinvest to downsize and distribute. That is the name of the game. This is so bad that even the Wall Street Journal complains about the cuts in research and development in the pharmaceutical industry. They said, hey, they're not making new products because they're cutting down their R&D to do stock buybacks. Straight out of the Wall Street Journal. Not exactly a radical uh, uh, newspaper. All right, so this starts, this whole process that we just saw here, this is what we call financial strip mining. This is the strip mining of corporate America to, to siphon out the wealth and put it into their own pockets. And this helps explain why average real wages stagnate, why financial and CEO income skyrocket, why good jobs and benefits are under pressure and declining, et cetera. So if it only hit every corporation, it would be a sad event. But unfortunately, it's even worse. It's hitting all of us. So if, if you're still with me, raise your hand if you're sleeping. <laughs> all right, if you're still with me. Uh, let me show you the impact of financial strip mining on the rest of us. Uh, uh, by the way, those of you who are my age and have any extra uh, Prozac with them, feel free to share it with your friends. Because <laughs> we got to go down for a while before we go up. I'm sorry about that. Somebody likened my talk to uh, Dante in the circles of hell. I hope it's not quite that bad. But uh, all, right. all right. So. How does it impact our communities and public sector workers? Let me, let me walk you through this. By the way, we do this. And uh, uh, Aiden and, and, and Cesar do this as an eight-hour workshop. And all these questions are participatory. And they don't, they don't do any lecturing. And they walk you through this. They do a fantastic job. So uh, I'll tell you more about that later. Uh, the first thing that happens is they, when they load up these companies with debt, it changes the picture. This is corporate debt in the United States from 1945 Till today, virtually no corporate debt until around 1980 when the financial deregulation took place. And now it's about $8 trillion of corporate debt. Forget about the government debt. The corporate debt is enormous. Now, how many people here have a mortgage? Interest payments on your mortgage are deductible. deductible. So are the interest payments on this. So that means corporate taxes go down. Look at this. They've fallen in half since 1980. So corporations are, are, have reduced their contribution to state and local government by half. And this starts to begin to answer the puzzle, how can the richest per, uh, country in the history of the world constantly be in a fiscal crisis? We can't afford anything, right? Every politician, right, Dr. K? Every politician 
is going to tell you, oh, we're, we can't afford this, we can't afford that, we, you know, et cetera. Well, corporations aren't paying anymore because of this financial strip mining. Now, the other thing is, how many people here have more than $10 million in assets? <laughs> Nobody? Where are the rich union leaders that I've heard so much about? I mean, a book's doing well, but not that well. Uh, 10, 10 million or up, you're not going to want to pay taxes. You don't have to pay taxes. You can move your money abroad. And uh, we estimate approximately, not just me, these are the uh, uh, research outfits, we're losing about $150 billion in taxes every single year due to money parked abroad. If you have a lot of money, you move it to the Cayman Islands or someplace, and you're just not going to pay that much in tax. And this is uh, how much is lost uh, uh, by state. Anybody here from uh, New York originally? 4.3 billion a year in tax revenues that are lost due to this money moved overseas. Uh, North Carolina, a billion a year. You made it to the top 10, congratulations. A uh, uh, billion dollars a year of lost revenue. Okay, now, we're supposed to have a progressive tax system. The rich are supposed to pay a higher percentage than the poor. And a flat tax would be everybody pays the uh, same percentage. Here's what we have. Because of the rich aren't paying and corporations aren't paying. Here, here's a perfect progressive tax system, right? This would be the poor down to the rich. 10.4%, 5.4%. This would have the rich paying twice as much as the poor. Uh-uh. Other way around. The top 1% is paying half as much as a percentage as the poor in state and local taxes. So that the rich aren't paying, the poor can't pay, the burden falls on the middle, and that's why there's a tax revolt going on all the time. That's why the richest country in the history of the world can't afford anything. And, th and this is how the whole book started. It started because my son had an internship in New York City, and he's walking around, there are all these people sleeping on the street, and people are kind of stepping around them, and stepping over them, and sort of holding their nose. And he lives, we live out in the burbs. Uh, it's a mixed suburb, but nobody's sleeping on the street. And he's going, what's going on? I thought we were a rich country. How come these people are sleeping on the streets? And I, I couldn't come up with an answer. I was going to write a book on uh, a homelessness, et cetera, et cetera. Next thing you know, I was led to run away inequality. This is why. We can't afford anything anymore. We'd let half the population sleep on the street as long as the, if, if, if the rich aren't paying and corporations aren't paying and the wealth is going up to them, we can't afford anything. Now. Uh, this has impacts. Still with me? Yeah. One more step down. Here we go. Corp when people have all that money, they use it to keep working the system in their behalf. Here in the, here's the 2014 elections, and we'll update this for 2018 soon or 16. Who paid what? Labor put in $54 million in 2014. Single issues like the environment put in uh, reproductive rights, et cetera, put in 71 million. Corporations and finance, 343 million. Not even close. All right, uh, there's, there's a very famous uh, study uh, by Gitlin and Page, conservative political scientists that show that nothing passes in Congress that doesn't uh, meet the needs of middle uh, 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 corporate and uh, financial interests. The only thing the average population ever gets are things that are also wanted by the wealthy and financiers. Never could they find a case. Almost like 2% or less than 2% of the bills over a 10-year period did we ever get what we wanted when the corporations didn't also want it. And they, they raise the question about whether we even have a democracy anymore. These are from conservative political scientists. All right. so. Uh, Here's, the, here's where the strip mining comes right into your community. Uh, all right, so you don't have tax money. How do you build anything? Well, you got to go to Wall Street to get the financing. Lo and behold, you can't tax them, but you got to go to them. You know, you can't tax the, uh, uh, you know, the, the loan shark. You got to go to the loan shark to get the money so that you can keep your community semi alive. Los Angeles. Here's a study that was done a few years ago in Los Angeles. Wall Street fees, not, there's 
not, not their interest payments, just the fees to close the deal, points, like points on your, ha on your uh, mortgage. The points that went to Wall Street, 334 million. The amount of money spent on, on the roads budget in Los Angeles, right, it's just about all roads in Los Angeles, was 163 million. Almost twice as much, twice, uh, more than twice as much, went to Wall Street in fees, strip mined out of Los Angeles, happening all over the country. Okay, how are we doing on time? You with me here? We okay? Good. All right. How strip mining impact the environment? Let me give you a little story. Uh, environmentalists somehow sometimes don't buy this story. They say, well, it doesn't matter to me. All I care about is climate change and it's an existential crisis and rich people give us money on the environment. They like it too, so why should we care? Watch this. Well, uh, there was a guy named Harry Wilson who was appointed in the Obama administration to be on the bailout, GM bailout task force. Uh, he was 37 years old, hotshot from Wall Street. So he works there. He learns all there is. The bailout, uh, he helps the bailout. Uh, uh, we bail out GM for $49 million, uh, billion dollars and tax. We lose, at the, at the end of this, we lose $11 billion. The workers give back $11 billion. And I don't know about you, at the time I thought, well, if Wall Street, if uh, GM gets on its feet again, uh, I expect them to make the greenest cars in the world and to treat their workers well. At least make the green cars, for God's sakes. All right, well, Harry leaves the Obama administration, and he's like now an expert on GM. So he forms, he gets four hedge funds together. By the way, those corporate raiders, we now call them hedge funds and private equity companies. We call them nice names. Same thing. He gets them to buy 34 million shares of GM. That's about $900 million. And then he goes to the board of GM when it gets on its feet again and says, we want your cash surplus all to go into stock buybacks. We want $5 billion stock buyback. And GM pulls it off. They say, sure, OK. First they resist a little bit. They play hard to get. Then they do it. They take it right out of the R&D budget. And Harry and his friends make about $200 million. And it not it nice? And we educated him, paid for his education on the task force. He walks off with 200 million, and we lose investments in green cars in America. So any, this is happening in any company that you think should be going greener and caring more about the environment, caring more about health and safety, the plant manager will laugh at you. He says, I have no budget for that, because his whole, the whole plant is being financially strip mined for the CEOs in Wall Street. So it has a big impact on the environment. All right, this is the last circle of hell. And this is, this is real hell. This doesn't just affect the economy. This impacts our entire way we view the world. We have changed how we view the world between the 1960s, let's say, and today. And I've seen it. Uh, I, I can't believe I've seen this in my, in my own lifetime. It blows my mind. Here we go. If you want an education, go into debt. How many students, how many people here are in debt or you're, or you're holding debts for your kids? 1960s, we wouldn't have known what you were talking about. New York and California, and to New Jersey primarily, were free, tuition-free places. Most of the big uh, you know, state schools, if you had a, a decent summer job, you could cover tuition. Now you go 10, 20, 30, 50, $100,000 in debt. This is viewed as normal. It was abnormal. This is the result of this new financial strip mining concept. If you're poor or jobless, you're on your own. When was the last time you heard about a war on poverty? That was the norm in 1960s. You know, we knew there were poor people in the inner city, poor people in Appalachia. We knew we had to do something about that. Poverty was like rediscovered in the 1960s. So we had a war on poverty. Now, that's out the door. We don't do that anymore. If you're a public sector worker, any public sector workers here? By definition, you are less valuable than a private sector worker, right? You're kind of on the government dole. The real money is made in the private sector. You're living off it. That's an entire flip from the 1960s. In the 1960s, how many people here saw The Graduate, the movie? You, do you remember the, the famous line in The Graduate? Plastics. Plastics. <laughs> right? Uh, Dustin Hoffman is sleeping with the wife of this guy he's talking to, and he's scared to death that he's been caught. And the guy's leaning over and says, I got to tell you just one word, one word. He thinks, oh, God. He says, plastics. 
And, and it was a joke because people knew that you know, working just for money was like not that important. It was important to do public service, Peace Corps, uh, teaching, inner city teaching. You know, this was a calling to work in government. The Kennedys used to joke about you know, people that just cared about making money. They want, you should serve. Now, you know, forget about it. That's changed. And finally, if you do want a poverty program, go to jail. And I'm not kidding. Let me show you what's happened to these areas during runaway inequality. Here's student loans. $1.2 trillion industry. Financial strip mining students and their families. Unheard of in the 60s. Very small. Matter of fact, mostly government subsidized. Here's children living in relative poverty, right? You don't have a public sector that cares anymore, that really works on it. Children living in relative poverty by country, Iceland, Finland, Norway, Netherlands up here, uh, other countries all over the place. Here's Romania, the worst, 25%. Who's second to, to last? The United States, 23.1% of our kids are living in relative poverty. Here's everybody else. By the way, the fairest countries, whoa, fairest countries are uh, the, ones, the ones with the least inequality are the ones that take care of their kids the best. Duh, because they, they have money to put into the public sector. That's how you take care of kids living in relative poverty. Now, this is a very telling one. This is, this is uh, unemployment and underemployment. Underemployment means uh, somebody that has a part-time job that wants a full-time job. This is uh, high school graduates, not dropouts, graduates. 50%, over 50% of black youth are unemployed or underemployed. Latino, 36%. Anglo, 33%. I mean, yes, it's worse for African-American uh, uh, youth, but it's bad all the way across the board. You think we would do something about this, right? If there ever was a, a place to do something, it would be right here. High school graduates, they did what we told them to do, stay in school, graduate, and then they can't find a decent job. Here's what we've done. Watch this. This is the prison population from 1910 onward. Let me narrate. 1910, 20, 30, 40, 50s. OK, here comes sex, drugs, and rock and roll in the 1960s. Watch what happens. Whoop. Went up a little bit. 1970s, we were still stoned in the 1970s. <laughs> Didn't go up much. Runaway inequality hits. Watch this. We have the most prisoners in the world. We have the, an absolute number and percentage, more than North Korea, Cuba, Albania, Russia, China. And the average income of somebody going to prison is like $19,000 for African American, $21,000 for Anglo, $20,000 for Hispanic. This is where we put poor kids. This is our war on poverty. This is where we suck up the surplus population. We put them in jail. This is a product of runaway inequality. Here's another product. Where's our expert, Dr. K, on uh, opiates? Here's the opiate, popul uh, uh, opiate deaths starting in 1980. Looks a lot like the runaway inequality line. This is how people are coping with, uh, I don't know about you, if you drive through rural areas of America, uh, it looks bad. It looks bad. You know, I just came back from a month in uh, Denmark, and I, I call it 50 shades of middle class. You don't see poor people. You don't see that many uh, wealthy homes. You just see all gradations of middle class, and it just looks prosperous. They don't have runaway inequality there. Anyway, now, now here's the prison population. Here's the, uh, the Wall Street wages. Now, you all heard of Michael Brown, Ferguson, Missouri? got killed by the cops. And uh, mostly this story is told as pure racial oppression. I want to show you the ugly hand of runaway inequality in the picture. There's an incredible study done by the Justice Department. They looked at 21 towns around St. Louis and how they raised their revenue. And they have this thing called fines and forfeitures. That's when the cop stops you, gives you a ticket for something, or you know, finds something to give you a ticket for, drags you into the criminal justice system. Then they find out maybe you owe some money for something else, and you have to pay court fees. Well, all these towns raise money that way to close their budgets, 
Corporations aren't paying, wealthy people aren't paying, they can't tax their people anymore, so they do it this way. And this is Ferguson, Missouri. All the way from 2004 to the crash of 2008, they, they got between 7 and 8% of their revenues from fines and forfeitures. Then along comes the crash, they're, they're stuck, they, they don't have money, so they tell their cops, go out there and double the amount of fines and forfeiture, fines that they, they, you know, arrest people on the street. We need double the amount of money. And Michael Brown happened to be on the street and was approached. We don't know exactly what happened, but he ends up dead. But we do know the emphasis to try to arrest people doubled before he was killed. So there's a direct impact between runaway inequality and uh, racial justice and oppression. When you're, and by the way, we think this is happening in thousands of towns across the country. Michael Brown. All right. OK, we're done. We're done. It's all over, all over but the crying. Even I wasn't sure if there was something depressing that was going to follow from this. What else did I throw in here? OK, so what do we do about this mess? And uh, if this was a workshop, we'd be spending a lot of time talking about this. But I'm going to walk you through uh, 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 some ideas here. First of all, there are two takeaways from this whole talk. The first one is, Runaway inequality will not cure itself. There's no magic pendulum swinging back and forth in the economy. Oh, it was just, in, it was better in the 1950s and 60s, then it got bad, now it's gonna get good again. Ain't happening, ain't happening. Doesn't happen that way. Financial strip mining is built into the system now. It is not gonna fix itself. Why should it? So if this is true, it leads to a second takeaway which is going to be difficult for us to bear because it makes an enormous responsibility on us. And that is, it's going to take a massive popular movement to counter runaway inequality, the likes we have not seen in our lifetimes. The, I'm setting the bar high for us because I know what the problem is that we have to deal with. It's a big problem. And what we're doing now isn't working. We've got Black Lives Matter. We got, here's the CWA Verizon workers on strike. We got the People's Climate March. We've got the fight for 15. We've got a lot of stuff going on. But it's all going on separately. It's all in its silos. And you know, I talk to environmentalists. I say, OK, you've been working on climate change for a long time now. And you're dedicated to it. And it really matters to you. Great. How are you doing? Have you assessed how your strategy is doing? Let's step back and look. We got a denier as president. We got a denier in, in, in uh, the majority in, in the House of Representatives, majority in the Senate, and a majority in the governorships. How much were, and we're pulling out of the Paris Accords, and we're deregulating uh, 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 industry, and we're promoting fracking and coal mining. How much worse can it get? What will it take for you to admit that your strategy may not be working? What would it take for you to consider an alternative strategy? And that's what we're about. We want these silos to begin to consider an alternative strategy, an alternative strategy built around a common movement around runaway inequality. Do we have any models? Fortunately, we do. Of all places, the populace, which is supposed to be a terrible word, the American populace of the 1880s and 1890s was a phenomenal movement. It was uh, small farmers in the South, largely, and in the Midwest, black and white, getting totally screwed by Wall Street, the big banks at the time. They, 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 their loans were going under. They were going under. They're losing their farms. They're, their prices are being squeezed. They've got monopolies controlling the railroads, the grain elevators, the stockyards. And, 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 and they built a new movement to take them on. They wanted cooperatives. They, want, they wanted uh, uh, a more cooperative market system owned and controlled by farmers. This is one of their posters. Uh, and here. They, 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 shook, they shook up the country. There's a great book, if you want to read it, it's called The Populist Moment by Lawrence Goodwin. And I mean, there was a war going on. You may, it took place right in this town. You know, from the end of the uh, 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 Civil War all the way to the 1890s, there was a battle for power in the South between the populace and the reactionary forces. And there was bloodbath in this town. In this town. It was in the 1890s. Up until then, there was a chance that the, uh, it took violence to finally break this movement. But anyway, uh, 
They want, one of the victories they got was the Bank of North Dakota, a public bank. That was one of their things on the platform. I called them up. I said, you know, what do you guys get paid? It's a public bank. And uh, 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 by the way, how many people here have to pay a, a check at the end of the year to the uh, state of North, uh, North Carolina taxes? Where does it go? Where does it go? I, I thought it went to some, I do it in New Jersey. I thought it went to some safe in Trenton, New Jersey. You know, they just put all the checks in there. When they need some money, they cash a few. Turns out it goes to a Wall Street bank. They're the only big enough ones to handle cash management for a state government, except in North Dakota. In North Dakota, the money goes to form the capital base. They then work through six, uh, 60 to 70 community banks, and they have programs like they make a loan out. They demand that one new job be created for every $100,000 loaned out to a business. So uh, it turns out North Dakota has the lowest unemployment rate, coincidentally. And uh, when I first brought this up, people said, oh, it's the oil boom. Well, now there's an oil bust. And they still have the lowest unemployment rate because they have a state bank that works for them. Anyway, so I call them up. Turns out that the uh, president makes $260,000. These are the top six officers. Uh, and you know, he makes about what I think the chef at, at Citibank makes in New York, or the chauffeur. And I said, what's the entry level pay get there? Full-time job, 35,000. I quickly take out my calculator and do the math. Seven to one, exactly what the American people think is fair and just, seven to one. So they ask him, by the way, this is the most profitable bank in the United States in terms of rate of profit. The money, all the profit goes to the people of North Dakota. Why did he lose any money during the, uh, during the crash? He said, oh, they kept kind of come to me and sell me these derivatives and stuff like that. I didn't know what they were talking about, so we didn't buy any. <laughs> and the, the bankers are telling us if we don't pay them $30 million a year, they couldn't run their bank. 260 will do it. Anyway, so here was their organizing strategy. Educate and organize. And then when they were done with that, they organized and educated. They put in the field 6,000, they were falling apart until they put in the field 6,000 educators, 6,000 in the 1880s to go around and explain how Wall Street worked, how they were being strip mined, you know, how, why they needed a, more, a, a different kind of economy that worked for them and not for, not for the fat cats. So I did the math, population growth and all. We need about 30,000 educators today, 30,000 to more or less do what Caesar's doing, what Aiden's doing, what I'm doing, uh, and what we've got right now, oh, I think we need another 29,500 or so. <laughs> but we're on the way. Uh, we, we only sort of started working on this uh, to spread this out uh, after Trump was elected, and I realized we, had better, uh, we better elevate our game. So what do we need to do? What, what should we focus on? The first thing is, there are four things. We need a common agenda and a common analysis. This silo stuff has got to kind of like, you know, we got to make our silos more porous. We got to be on the same page with a common agenda that holds us together. And we need an analysis. It can't just be, I'll support your issue, you support my issue. Because that'll fall apart. It has to be that those two issues are actually connected. And I think they're connected by runaway inequality. And if we, if we look at runaway inequality and financial strip mining, I think I can connect, connect every issue in this room. Uh, so I think we can pull this off. I think you know, Bernie gave it a good shot. And I, I think that uh, he's certainly into runaway inequality. And I'm hoping, by the way, I had no idea he was running when I wrote this book. He stole his entire platform from me, <laughs> the whole thing. Nothing original in there. And he hasn't given us credit. But we'll, we'll get him. We'll get him eventually. All right, the second thing we need is an educational infrastructure. That's my pay grade. We can build this. We can build an army of educators. People just like you can learn how to do our workshops. I, I, I just have done, the last 10 days, I've done three train the trainers, two in California, uh, one in Detroit. In California, we had the Sierra Club, the steel workers, and the communications workers uh, trained as trainers for two days. And uh, we had people from, uh, I'll tell you a funny story. We had. Uh, uh, people from Detroit, and we had a couple from Chicago. And one of the people that came from Chicago is this lovely woman named Letitia Wallace, African-American state rep representative from Rockford, Illinois. 
And she somehow came across the book and she said, I want to come, I want to be a trainer. She's all over this. She's been passing out the book in the state legislature. But she says, I can only stay for one day. I go, why? She goes, well, yesterday they put me on the ticket for lieutenant governor in the Democratic Party. So now we have a runaway inequality fanatic running for lieutenant <laughs> governor in the state of Illinois. So I don't know, that made me feel pretty good uh, that she was into it. So I think we can build a uh, educational infrastructure. Here's where it gets harder. We need a new state, national, local organization dedicated to reversing runaway inequality. I want to be able to walk into Pensacola or Patterson or Pomona or Peoria, I'm running out of peas, Phillipsburg, onward, uh, and walk into a meeting, show my membership card and say, okay, what do you work on? How, how are we going to uh, work on uh, reversing runaway inequality in this locality, in this state? I think we could build that movement. Uh, I think you can actually start it right here. You, imagine if we had something called Wilmington United, and all the different groups represented in this room came together and actually uh, set it up as a dues-paying membership, $25. What is that? What is Bernie's average? $26? Twenty-seven. I'll bet you uh, a quarter of the Bernie people right in this area would put up twenty-seven dollars to be part of that uh, a year to be part of that organization. We can build it, but this is over my pay grade. I represent five people on a good day, assuming the rest of the staff is even listening to me, in New York. I don't represent six hundred thousand steel workers, or six, or how many ILA people, or uh, uh, six hundred thousand communication workers, or even what your organizations here represent you could come together and form this and become a model for how we break out of our silos. But you won't do that until we conquer the fourth thing, which is we need a new activist identity. No matter what else we are, we can be a racial justice advocate, we can be a clean water advocate, we also have to be movement builders. We have to see ourselves as building a movement powerful enough to reverse runaway inequality, or it can't possibly happen. It's not gonna just fall from the sky. We can't just wait for the next Messiah. You know, uh, you know Bernie's getting older. He's even older than me. Uh, not by much, by the way. Uh, so, so we have to actually start to believe in ourselves that we can build a movement. And that's not going to happen until we have that identity. So when I finish up these talks, uh, by the way, one of the things we're throwing out there oh, is we have this petition. You can see it on the website. I'm going to let this go. Uh, because we're, we're moving along here, it's getting late. Here are the challenges that this educational movement, this new organization has to deal with. We have to figure out how we do this. How do we break out our, our silos and become movement builders? That's, that's, that, that's a trick. And we also have to figure out how do we reach those voters that voted for Obama once or twice, hard to call them racist, then voted for Sanders, or supported Sanders, and then voted for Trump out of cheer frustration. We have found, by the way, half the steel workers who voted, voted for Trump. They also were for Bernie. And I work with them a lot. And we've had them in these workshops, and you can move them with the runaway inequality analysis. I just, I just did this, uh, I was in uh, Region 9A of the UAW. I'm just telling you stories now, but this one is interesting. And it's very progressive. They have these uh, women who run it, and they have a lot of public sector workers. But they, they don't have any auto workers left, but they have a couple of uh, very conservative locals. Colt Industries, guns. Electric Boat, what do they do? Electric Boat makes nuclear submarines. Big locals. They came, I gave this rap there, they came up to me afterwards, they said, come to my local. Come to my local, we, wanna hear, we, want, we want the membership to hear this. People are ready to fight runaway inequality. I'm not making this up, people are ready to do this if you're ready to reach out to them. All right, so when I finish up these raps, I go, we need an army of educators. Are you interested? Raise your hand if you're interested. Want to join the army. OK, that's what usually happens. All right, so, so uh, up until Trump was elected, I would do this. Everybody would raise their hands. Then you, know, you sort of steer the ending to try to get an applause. You know, makes you feel good and stuff like that. And, and then you walk out. I walked out. I had a good life. Wrote books, wrote articles and got to give talks and had no responsibility for what happened afterwards. And guess what happened afterwards? Nothing happened afterwards, except uh, in the CWA, who got very committed to this. But generally, nothing happened. 
you know, 900 steel workers would raise their hands out of 1,000, and then I'd walk out. Trump got elected, I said, no go. So we set up uh, a website, and we started asking people at the, at the end of my articles and the talks, said, go to the website and sign up if you want to be part of the Runaway and Equality Education Network. And this is what we have, it's about two or three weeks old. And you can see, we need more people here. We only got a few, North Carolina. This, is all, this, this has happened since February. This is, un, this is basically unsolicited. This is just from a tagline at the end of my article saying, oh, if you're interested in being a runaway and equality trainer, go to this website. So go to this damn website, <laughs> sign up, and we will help you build a infrastructure in, in Wilmington, in this county, and in this state to support a movement to reverse runaway inequality. We will, build, we will help you build that infrastructure. We will train trainers. If you say, you put your, if you say yes, there's a, it's a very simple box you fill out, and it says, do you want to be a trainer? Yes. If you do, great. If not, you just get an email every now and then uh, about what we're doing. But we need you. And uh, like I said, usually at the end of these talks, I angle for an applause, because it makes me feel great you know, <laughs> when you guys do it. <laughs> the game's changed. You want to applaud, go ahead. But this time, you're applauding for what you're going to do. You're making a commit. When you applaud, you're making a commitment to move this idea forward, or nothing's going to happen. It's on us. You know, Trump got elected on our watch. It's not all these external things. We've been organizing this way for 40 years. It's our responsibility, too. And this is the time to change it. People are hungry for change. Let's help them get it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to announce again that books are, we still have some books on sale. If you don't have a book, if you do have a book, might be able to get, uh, uh, we might take a few questions and then uh, you might be able to get your book signed by Mr. Leopold. That costs extra. Yeah. Uh, I'm just wondering, historically, has this kind of change that we proposed ever happened peacefully or without any conflict? Where is this kind of a equality? I think in America, the only kind of change uh, progressives can pull off is peaceful. I think any ch any other kind isn't going to work, and I think for the most part the biggest change is yeah. I mean the civil right, the, the violence is usually against us, so it wasn't pro the labor movement in the 30s, the civil rights movement in the in the 60s, uh, the populist movement. They were all peaceful movements until they got whacked. Yeah. Have you approached Reverend Barber in starting the Poor People's Campaign, and I believe uh, Dr. Martin Luther King because he started. Yeah, he. Reverend Barber is on this level. I'm, I'm going, he and I are going to this kind of private conference in November, and I'll get a chance to talk, talk to him more directly. Uh, I really applaud everything you're doing. I strongly agree with a lot of your ideas, but I'm concerned with your ideas on banking. OK, you hold the Bank of North, Car of North Dakota as kind of the model. Do you really uh, believe that a nationwide banking system should be made up of no, I believe, I, I, I believe in free enterprise. I believe in competition, the public option. Let there be a state bank in every state, and let it compete with the Wall Street banks. Let them compete. Let's see who can provide the, uh, the lowest infrastructure cost loans. Would you abolish the Federal Reserve System? No, I would just put the, make, make sure that the, uh, the presidents of the public banks were on it as well, and that there were community representatives. You, you know, I, I, I don't believe in a conspiracy at the, at the Federal Reserve. The conspiracy is on Wall Street. It's not even a conspiracy. It's like right out in the open. I mean, they just, you know, it's right revolving door between them and Washington. Yes? What is it going to look like, and how long is it going to take? I don't know what it's going to look like. Uh, I've been surprised. If you, were, if you recall, in uh, the summer of 2011, the Obama administration was negotiating with Congress over austerity, the grand bargain. They were going to cut Social Security a little bit. They were going to work on the budget 
we were going to tighten our belt. Then out of nowhere came Occupy Wall Street. Completely changed the conversation. Austerity off the table. Social Security protected. Because a, a bunch of kids sat in at a park, and next thing you knew, there were 900 encampments around the world saying we are the 99%. So I don't know what it's going to look like. Bernie Sanders, you're going to tell me a grumpy old Jewish guy from Brooklyn almost going to defeat Hillary Clinton in the primaries? Who would have thought that? When he started running, I remember a bunch of us just said, oh, sure, Bernie. He's been around since the 1960s. They're going to elect him? No way. Almost wins. Not because he's a charismatic leader. It's because he was saying the truth about how the system works. So I don't know what it's going to look like. I know we're going to be surprised, but I know that you're going to help make it happen. How soon? Be 30 days for all I know. It could happen anytime. But we have but I, I believe in a longer term building of infrastructure. You gotta build it right. You got you know, you gotta we need a lot of uh, Wilmington Uniteds to prop up around the country. Yes. So have you reached out to some of these other organizations that you talked about that were independent and what had response? The way we work is kind of by invitation. So uh, we don't go try to barge into a group and say, you know, you got to do it this way. They hear about us and they say, come in and do a sample talk. And then that opens up a discussion. And in no place have we been rejected. The idea of building this educational infrastructure has been largely accepted and spreading. Uh, I feel very, and we're not competing with anybody because nobody else is doing it. So it's kind of wide open and it, it's viewed as support for what people are already doing. And most of the groups actually would like to break out of their silos. They're not just, they're kind of not sure how to do it. It's a good idea. When we get a, little, we get a few more people involved, I think we can do that. I mean, we're just a little baby organization. All right, give you the last one. Why does North Dakota have a state bank and North Carolina Because the populists were stronger in North Dakota for a longer period of time. The populists got literally killed, beaten up and killed. What, a hundred and something died, I believe, in in, uh, 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 in Wilmington. North Dakota, they, they had more control and they stayed in power longer. So it passed, uh, it, it, they, were, they had control of the legislature. Oh, absolutely, 1919. Thank you. Thank you. This land is your land. This land is my land From California To the New York Island From the Redwood Forest To the Gulf Stream water This land was made by you and me It's a land of freedom A land of plenty Of equality a land of opportunity In spite of severity We created prosperity This land was made by you and me This land is your land This land is my land From California To the New York Island From the Redwood Forest To the Gulf Stream this land was made by you and me This land was made by you and me This land was made for you and me This land is your land This land is my land from California to the New York Island From the Redwood Forest to the Gulf Stream water This land was made by you and me It's a land of freedom, a land of plenty Of equality, a land of opportunity in spite of Severity, we created prosperity. This land was made by you and me. This land is your land. This
This land is my land From California To the New York Island From the Redwood Forest To the Gulf Stream water This land was made by you and me This land was made by you and me